Congress has four months to keep the country from defaulting on its debt by raising the debt ceiling. Iowa lawmakers plan to change a property tax calculation that some local governments don't like. And Illinois state lawmakers got a raise along with statewide office holders. We'll get to that this morning with Iowa Republican Party Chair Jeff Kaufman and former Rock Island Mayor Mark Schwiebert, a Democrat. Great to see you both. Let's get started right away with Illinois. State lawmakers got a pay raise of $12,000 this year. They're now the fourth highest paid legislators in the United States. The Illinois Policy Institute indicates that makes the starting pay $85,000 a year for a part-time job. This while the average Average pay for lawmakers across the country is about $35,000. There are also raises for the governor, lieutenant governor, comptroller, treasurer, attorney general, and secretary of state. Now, however, Governor J.B. Pritzker does not take a salary personally. Now, the pay increases were included in the budget adopted last year. Illinois Democrats are certainly trying to shed the reputation of being bad with money and point to a budget surplus, but analysis by Pew Charitable Trusts indicates the state tax revenue actually falls short of total expenses by 5%. And these pay raises range from 9 to 18 percent so is this a good move considering a lot of places aren't even keeping their employees up to date with the rate of inflation mark i would not be in favor of this i know when i was mayor we uh, i passed up a couple of opportunities for pay raises i think when we're living in uncertain times and these have been kind of uncertain times economically although things seem to be stabilizing considerably now uh doing pay raises just gives a bad message uh, for, for elected officials I do recognize the need to increase pay for certain executive positions for the simple reason that if you want to recruit good people, you have to pay money that's comparable to what the private sector is paying. But I think from the standpoint of public sector elected officials, I would not have been in favor of this, and I don't think it's a good thing. Jeff, I bet you might agree with Mark on this point. I do. And you know, in Iowa, we're a true citizen legislature, and so we're less than $40,000 a year. And, I, and here's, a, here's another little secret that's not being told, or I wouldn't say secret, but it's certainly not being promoted. And that is they get per diems as well. So you add that on top of that raise, and not only are they part-time, if you look at the legislators that are not full-time, that this makes Illinois number one. This is just not justifiable on multiple levels, and I say that as a former legislator. Let's move on to our next topic here. Republican state lawmakers in control of Iowa's government intend to change the property tax code this session. They say they need to correct a mistake made by earlier changes in the code. Multi-residential properties got mixed in with single residential property tax calculations and single homeowners wanted to pay more taxes than they should have, they argue. And Republicans want to lower that immediately. The problem here is that local governments base their budgets on this current formula and would not have that money they expect or need to provide their services. So what about a middle ground solution to phase in this change or delay it to give local governments time to adjust, Jeff? Well, and I'm on one of those local governments. I'm on a board of supervisors. And here's the thing, this was a bureaucratic mistake. No doubt about it, it was a mistake. This is money that the local governments should not have had. They have given them more time to adjust those budgets. And uh, look, you can say that this is a $133 million hut, hit to local governments, but this is a $133 million property tax increase on Iowans as well. As a member of the Cedar County Board of Supervisors, we've got a little bit more time. Shame on any local government that has made things so tight that they can't absorb something like this. And don't tell me about we're gonna have to fire uh, all of those sensitive areas like public safety and such. There is room in any reasonable budget to make this adjustment. The money should have never been there. The mistakes should have never been made, but it should not fall back on the backs of the Iowa taxpayer. Mark, do you have an opinion on this that's different than Jeff's? Yeah, I, I, I do. And I'm probably less concerned with the mistake that was made because we are uh, human and, and to err is human as the saying goes. And legislators can make those kinds of mistakes. So uh, this is a $133 million mistake, so it's more than a minor one. Uh, having been in local government, I'm also mindful of the fact that unfunded mandates are a real burden that local governments have to deal with. And when they're given instructions by the state that they're going to have a certain amount of money, $133 million more than now it appears they're going to get, that does take an impact. And it may not mean laying a lot of people off, but it's certainly going to have an impact on public works. It's going to have an impact on public safety and a whole range of other things. I think probably the bigger issue, though, is the, the, the message that we're getting out of the legislature that they're going gangbusters on tax cuts. Uh, Kansas tried that back in 2012, and they lived to regret it. Iowa so far has cut their income tax. Uh, they're getting rid of the budget surplus by basically doing tax cuts. They're going to a flat tax, which we've had here in Illinois with bad results for the last 50 years. I think uh, five years from now, 
uh, uh, five to ten years from now, Iowans are going to be really regretting some of the drastic measures that the Iowa legislature is taking to basically deprive government of the resources it needs to do its job. That is something we'll find out over in time for sure. Let's get to one topic before we go. We'll finish with the debt ceiling and the political fight to raise it. There could be serious economic consequences we know if it doesn't happen by June. Let me point out two things. First, the 14th Amendment. Section 4 of it says the validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. Basically, that the law dictates the country cannot default. And the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868. Now, fast forward to 1917. That's when Congress adopted the Second Liberty Bond Act and established the debt ceiling for the first time. It's been around ever since and raised dozens of times. Now, let me pose this question to you. How is the debt ceiling even constitutional? And what about criminal punishment for anyone who violates the Constitution by preventing the country from meeting its obligations, Jeff? Well, I mean, it's constitutional if the Supreme Court interprets the 14th Amendment in that way. And, and so at any given time, the constitutionality of that can be looked at. I, I still see that uh, interpretation as valid. I'm not a constitutional uh, uh, expert. The other thing I would add, though, and this I think is very important, if we don't have these stop gaps where you actually have to pause and say, hold it, we just put another trillion dollars on our great grandchildren. We talk about tax cuts and the impact that that would have five years from now. What in the world is these trillion dollar deficits? And there have been Republicans and Democrats a part of that. So this is not a partisan statement. But we have got to have moments when we at least say time out and at least have to take a vote. And who knows, maybe at some point in time, these Congress people will not let this go to the last minute because make no bones about it. The reason this is a crisis is because they make it a crisis by delaying it. And we have got to somehow, some way, keep running up trillions of dollars. Common Sense 101 says that a country cannot sustain this itself like this over generations. Certainly I think this is a good thing. Certainly fiscal responsibility is important, but I guess on this issue, Mark, what about the constitutionality of it? And how come it hasn't, it's never been challenged in the Constitution or in the Supreme Court. It has come well, up, in a, it has come I, up I think, in a case, but that wasn't relevant to that particular issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that probably in part it hasn't been challenged because both parties have been willing to suspend those requirements. In fact, during the Trump four years, it was suspended three different times uh, in order to support, I might add, a, a multi-billion dollar tax cut for the wealthy. So it, it really is, you know, whose ox is getting gored here? And it's a little hard, I think, to get too self-righteous about the national debt when the Republicans have been as guilty as the Democrats of running that debt up, and sometimes a lot more in order to support tax cuts for the rich. But I think that in terms of the constitutionality argument, there is a strong argument that can be made that a number of constitutional scholars have pointed out that a debt ceiling, which is a legislated requirement, is not something that is, is, is mandated by the Constitution, certainly. And it's not even something that's probably condoned by the Constitution because the Founding Fathers and those who passed the 14th Amendment in the 1860s recognized that the full faith and the credit of the United States is critical. And if you've undertaken a debt, you have to pay it. If you don't, the consequences are dire. If the Republicans had their way on this and they held up approving a debt ceiling li uh, limit increase, which they approved three times during the Trump administration, it could force a nation into an economic recession that would be greater than the one we experienced in 2008. So we shouldn't be playing around with this. This is a serious business, and it's time for some of those in Congress who are willing to play kind of extremist games to get off the high horse and get with honoring our debts as a nation that we've fairly undertaken. It's constitutionally required, and I think it just makes good policy sense. Oh, and I would just add, that's a very partisan analysis. I think I can lay the blame on Democrats to a higher degree than the Republicans any time, Mark. I was trying to make this nonpartisan, but that's a pretty that's a pretty biased analysis. It, it, I think you'll find those deficits have gone up higher during the Reagan years and the Trump years than, than, than to a larger extent during the Democratic years. I don't think that holds years. up the facts. You can have your opinion, you can't have your facts, Mark. Well, that's, that's, another, that's another fact we'll have to check it another time, guys. But that's you both, make, you both yeah. make valid points. <laughs> Mark Schreiber, Jeff Coffin, thanks for the discussion as always. Both of you be safe. And that brings us to our question of the week. What do you think about the pay raises given to Illinois state lawmakers and statewide office holders? Send your answer by email to for the record at whbf.com or you can respond to this post on Facebook at the local 4 news WHBF TV page or on my page.